surgeon has, let us say, three tasks to perform. The first is hermeneutic, to read a scriptural text with understanding. The second is philosophical, to develop and explore questions for thought arising from the text. The third task is directly theological, to draw conclusions from the reading and questioning to strengthen the confession of faith. And today we shall try in a very small compass to perform all three of these. First then to our text. This is a line from the long Psalm. Psalm 119 in the Hebrew numbering, Psalm 118 in the Septuagint. And it reads, good art thou and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. 10 words in English, but the Hebrew original makes do with just five. Let's take a look at them. Tovada umeti lomadene hucheka. With apologies to those whose Hebrew is much better, as, uh, as I'm sure many people's is than mine. The long psalm is full of short sayings that we can easily look at on their own. But it's almost always better not to look at them on their own. Each saying has its place and is illumined by what lies around it. And this is a poem of unusually elaborate architecture, an alphabetical poem in which each letter of the Hebrew alphabet in turn stands at the beginning of eight successive lines, making 22 stanzas, one for each letter. Here at line 68, we're in the middle of the ninth stanza, and each line begins with the letter tet, which has a soft T sound like the Greek equivalent theta. Now the emphasis in each line of this poem falls on the alliterated word at the beginning. And so to read the poem with understanding, we need to know what the first word of each line is. And our English translations do not tell us that. So that English readers lacking that crucial key tend either to find the poem very dull or pick the sweet sayings on their own out of their context. Now, many features of the poem's language simply cannot be rendered in English, but it's actually not difficult to keep the initial words in first place. So let's take a look at the ninth stanza organized in that way. Good hast thou done with thy servant Adonai, according to thy word. Good discretion and knowledge do thou teach me, for I believe in thy commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep to thy word. Good art thou, and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. They besmear me with lies, the insolent but I keep thy precepts wholeheartedly. Gross like fat is their heart, but I delight in thy law. Good it was for me that I was afflicted, that I should learn thy statutes. Good for me is the law of thy mouth, more than thousands of gold and silver. Now, as we see at once, the five out of the eight lines begin with the word good. I include the second line in this count, though it's popular to um, amend it. The stanza has an obvious shape. It begins and ends with good. And in the fifth and sixth lines, it veers off into evils, smearing and grossness suggesting lying and stupidity. And the initial line of word three is before, which is tied to the verb, I was afflicted. 
And that verb is then repeated in line seven to balance it, making us recall how evil and good experiences are distributed across our experience of time, time past, time present, time future. But the five occurrences of good in this stanza are all different. At the beginning, there is the good of action, not ours, but God's action. Good hast thou done. Then good is linked with discretion and knowledge as a virtue to be lived and to be taught. In the seventh line, there is a good of experience which transforms affliction by yielding personal enrichment and maturity. And finally, we meet a good of choice in which one good is preferred to another. The good of God's speech outweighing the good of wealth acquired by industry and good luck. Four very different types of good. Two of them associated with the past, one with the present, one with the future. And in the middle of the stanza, surrounded by the others, is the good that the poet calls on, addressing it as the. So the scattered experiences of good, past, present and future, are bound together at the center of the poet's experience as he calls on the good and as he makes a petition asking for a way of appropriating the good and molding his life on the basis of it. Teach me thy statutes. Now, it's worth noticing the words that the poet in his skillful economy leaves out. He does not need the copular verb, thou art. If we say in English, thou art good, we have the impression of attributing the quality of goodness to God in a synthetic judgment. Just as the mountains are high and the lake is deep, so God is good. But the poet simply calls on the good, good thou. Of course, he knows that the divine name Adonai means I am what I am. He knows that the divine goodness is one with the divine being. But just at this moment, he turns his attention from the divine being in order to address the divine good. And if we take only one thing away from this line, I suggest it should be this. Our experience of the good is not originally derived from anything that simply is, or is not originally attributed to anything that simply is. The good is met with. Similarly, he omits the verb to do. We say good art thou and doest good, but instead he uses a rather unusual verbal form derived directly from the adjective, as though in English we were to say gooding. And that allows us to think all at once of being good, willing good, doing good, making good, all kinds of ways of realizing goodness. When we say doing good, we hear good as something done. We're then tempted to think that good belongs to a state of affairs and that God is called good because the states of affairs that he brings about are good states of affairs. But our poet suggests that he is, he is the good that he does. Thou the good and gooding one. We meet with God's goodness immediately in God's acts. Scholastic philosophers had a useful Latin expression that catches this emphasis rather well. They used to speak of bonum diffusivum sui, self-imparting good. And since we can't go on for very long using the ungrammatical expression, good gooding, let's take a leaf out of their book and speak of God as the self-communicative 
good. Good cannot keep itself to itself. It is the principle of its own communication or sharing. Finally, the poet does not need the definite article, the. Philosophical convention refers to the good, following a habit in ancient Greek, which often used that means of forming what we think of as abstract nouns, tokalon, the beautiful, or beauty, toilethes, the true, or truth, and so on. But if we were to paraphrase our line, thou art the good, or goodness, that would not quite catch what the poet means. An abstract noun is formed by abstraction in thought. It assumes that good is first of all an adjective, a qualification applied to something, and only secondly, a noun. So to reach the good, we start from what a good idea, a good horse, a good Samaritan, and a good tune all have in common. But that's not how our poet proceeds. He's not searching for a common factor. He's looking for a source of all the good things. There is a good behind these many goods, a good that he can say nothing about, but can only speak to. Not speaking to open a conversation with the good, of course, but to answer a self-communication of the original good. And that is the position we need to adopt first, if we hope to speak intelligently about the many forms of good there are later on. For goodness is predicated in many different ways of different kinds of things. We call some things good simply because they exist or happen. We call other things good because in some way they give us enjoyment or because they open the way for us to act or because we feel the lack of them when we do not have them. And if the first question we ask ourselves is what all these different experiences of good have in common, we shall certainly end up in bewilderment which is why our talk about good always seems to be in danger of dissolving, flying away into fragments. I once preached on the text, I have no good apart from thee, in Psalm 16. And after the sermon, a thoughtful elderly member of the congregation said to me, I never before heard anyone suggest that there really was such a thing as the good which is where the philosophical culture of our time has left us. We know that there are things and relations among things. We know that there are facts and relations among facts. But the good has fallen right through the cracks out of our knowledge. <clears throat> well, the philosophers, to give them credit, never intended the good to fall out in this way. What they intended to do was to locate it precisely so that we should always know where to find it. Now, I confess that I'm unusual. I'm usually suspicious when people say the kind of thing that I am just about to say. There are two different theories of ethics. There are three different theories of punishment and so on. I always find myself tempted to reply, are you quite sure there aren't two or three hundred? Yet I'm going to say that the philosophers have broadly located the good in three different places and then cover myself by insisting that that's no more than a rough sketch map highlighting the major features of the landscape of this discussion. Those three places are, and we'll take a look. Good located in the will. We speak of the good when we ask, wish, desire, 
or decide that something should happen. Secondly, good located in the form of a thing. So that to be a good something is to be an, to be that thing in an exemplary or typical way. Thirdly, good located in the sense of obligation and duty. Now of these three ideas of the good, the good as willed is obviously the most subjective. If we ask what the good is, it suggests, we can only say that it is what we wish, what we have an interest in. There is good to enjoy. That need not, of course, confine our interests to narrowly private concerns. We can have wide and generous interests in the welfare of others, the safeguarding of the world. We can even have an interest in what will happen after our death. We can have an interest in the South Pole without the slightest desire ever to go and see it. Yet all these broad interests on this account come down to our interest in the horizons of the world we know and occupy. We may have broad horizons, but the implication of tying the good to them is that we never want new horizons or discover new goods. The good is a projection of the will, so that we must will a thing before we recognize that it is good. But that surely turns the order of moral experience on its head. We experience good as opening up to us to be discovered in ways that we've never anticipated or desired. Who will show us any good? Asked another psalmist. We often need to be shown the good that is worth our willing. Secondly, the formal good offers us a way of escape from the subjectivity of the willed good. Good now becomes a designation for whatever is typical or exemplary of the sort of thing it is. There is a good of its kind. There are good knives, good businesses, good tunes. The good knife is the one that cuts most efficiently. The good business is the one that makes a profit, and pays a decent wage. The good tune is the one you go on humming and so on. Now the good of anything on this account is wrapped up in what is typical of its kind. The same principle applies to natural things. Trees typically grow tall, have leaves and live for many years. So a good tree is leafy, high and long lived. There is therefore nothing in the world that is simply a good thing as such. For if we do not know what kind of thing it is that we're talking about, we have no way of knowing whether it's good of its kind. How could we ever explain good actions or good people on this basis? By tying the good to the kinds of things which we know quite a lot about, we have denied ourselves the most important and far reaching uses of the word good. A good act must not only be effective in achieving its end as acts typically are, it must also achieve something good, worth acting for. A good person must not only be free and self-directing as persons typically are, but must attain some quality over and above being simply personal. There are so many different ways in which acts and persons may be good, that we have to think of the good as transcending the imminent goods that belong to forms. The good of a life shaping event is a good in itself, independent of whatever form that event may take. It may be falling in love. It may be being converted. 
It may be receiving a large legacy. It may be reading Plato for the first time. It may be any of them. But the good of that event is precisely that it enlarges us and redirects us. It draws us into its own sphere of reference rather than conforming to any sphere of reference by which we measure it. Thirdly, then, the obligatory good seeks to anchor this transcendence in a sense of demand. It understands the good in terms of the demand it makes on us, coming from beyond us, intruding on us, setting our expectations to one side, taking us out of ourselves. There is good to be done. Our experience of the good may sometimes be imperious in this way, dictating terms to the conduct of our lives. Yet if demands that transcend our hopes and expectations cannot enable us to transcend ourselves in order to identify with them, or if they can only do so by destroying something else that is precious, we have no way of seeing that they are good. An unqualified demand for surrender to the good, which cannot show us its good grounds in the reality of the world or in our own being, is, if it is a good at all, a good way beyond our ken. It would be as though we were shown Simeon Stylites on top of his pillar and told to take him as our model in living well. Well, perhaps there is something distinctively good in living life that way. But in order to see what it is, you have to be someone, I have to confess, very unlike me. So in distinguishing our real obligations from merely peremptory and arbitrary demands, we depend on a prior understanding of what is good. You ought, therefore you can, obligation tells us, to which we can hardly avoid answering, perhaps somebody ought, perhaps somebody can, but are you sure it's me? Augustine's famous prayer that so offended Pelagius when he read it in the Confessions was da quod ubes, give what you command. And that prayer was profound. Yes, there are moral demands and the good makes demands, but they need to have an element of gift to be recognized as such. We must receive them first. Now, each of these three approaches, I think, if followed through resolutely and single-mindedly, leads to moral bewilderment and despair of the good. And yet, each of them has something important to say. First, knowing the good is only possible if I can acknowledge an interest in it, direct or indirect. Second, recognizing good in any form is to recognize a way of being something. And thirdly, recognizing good is possible only if I'm open to rising to its demand. So here then we must leave the philosophical puzzle without the kind of answer we might have hoped to find. We cannot make the good univocal. The variety of ways in which we speak of good is not reducible to one basic way of speaking of it from which all the others then derive. Good is a way in which we find the world. Good is a way in which we dispose ourselves. Good is a way in which we experience a demand. This language of the good introduces us to a cosmic drama in which all three of those things happen. The true meaning of our lives breaks upon us from outside us. It appears to us in the world as it exists. It appears to us in a conception of the world as it does not yet exist. We can never attribute good, understanding what we are saying, without engaging this 
whole set of analogical predications. And so engaging with our part in the drama, whatever it may be. We can't draw a line under the good anywhere. Just as there is indeed good to enjoy, so there is also good of its kind and there is also good to be done. And the source of all these goods is a good we cannot imagine or conceive, but must simply call upon. This brings us finally to our two theological conclusions. The first of which must be this. A knowledge of the good is a knowledge of what is given to us, a knowledge of grace. There's no other way of knowing the good, but as a communication. We cannot devise a good either to do or to enjoy. All knowledge of the good is given to us. And the analogy of good and the goods is in reality an analogy of grace. That phrase, analogy of grace, was Karl Barth's coinage in response to the claim that we may come to know God by an analogy of being. No, he replied, but through the analogical form of God's giving communicating being to all that has been, promising fulfillment to all that he has made. Good is revealed to us as absolute because it is communicated to us already, even in the very fact of our existence. Never, even in flights of abstract thought, do we get back behind that primary gift of God. Good is revealed to us as objective because it's the form of the world we inhabit, within which we participate as subjects. To speak of such an original gift of the world is to speak of creation. Creation is the matrix within which we conceive of the good. Knowledge of the good follows the logic of experience, initially particular, momentary and subjective, but then forging connections between one moment and another, between ourselves and the world in which we interact. And so it is that we come to understand particular goods, the good of life, the good of food, the good of sunshine and so on, within the framework of a good world. When God looked on all that he had made and behold, it was very good. It was a real and complete good that he saw. It lacked nothing, nothing lacked it. And that was what was meant by the church fathers when they spoke of a unity of good and being. God as absolute being, I am that I am, is the fountain of goodness. The original Sabbath was not simply a moment of divine complacency, it was also a moment of divine purpose out of which the goodness of what was made was communicated against the horizon of time. The dynamic of created good is the dynamic of history and no concept of history is intelligible except that of moral history, a history of the good that is given to be fulfilled. The creator accompanies and directs a good world to its goal, to its temporal fulfillment. So the epistle to the Hebrews speaks of another Sabbath rest to enter. Bonhoeffer said that it was the profound secret of history as a whole, that free action as it determines history, recognizes itself ultimately as God's action. In giving us to be part of a good world, God gives us also the power to be agents within the world, to have good to do within a good that is already done. Our doing things is a gift among gifts, the gift that is most perfectly suited to our nature as created agents, for whom nothing is more deadening 
than inactivity. There are good works designed by God beforehand for us to walk in, we're told in the epistle to the Ephesians. When was that beforehand? It was in the act of creation itself, when human beings were made for agency in obedience to God. And then it was in each sub subsequent moment of time as the next moment of the future horizon opens up before us with its new opportunities. When we recognize something given to us to do, we recognize God's command that we should do it for gift and command go together, as in Augustine's prayer. And if we can see that command as bound up from the very first with the great and lavish gift of being God's fellow workers within the world, then the yoke of the command is easy and its burden is light. And so to our second conclusion. What is given to us is the gracious God himself. And we encounter him as the inner meaning of all other good. There is none good but God alone, said Jesus to the ruler who asked, good teacher, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Not that you can't call anything good besides God. There are good teachers. There are good things to do. Eternal life itself is good. But to grasp the sense in which teachers are good and things to be done are good and eternal life is good, we must see them as good by virtue of their source. God has designed creation and history to express himself. If we do not reach that assertion, then the identity of being in the good becomes insecure and doubtful. All that is, is good, may sound like an evident truism, but so may the opposite. Knowing good means knowing good and evil. In our human condition, which is not that of Adam and Eve in paradise, we have no experience of the good without some experience of evil too. Some goods we only know when we suffer the loss of them. How can we say then that the experience of good is more fundamental, more ultimate and more real than the experience of evil? We are always tempted by the temptation of nihilism, by which we commonly mean our anxiety in the face of goods passing out of existence. Since all our experience is in time and every experience comes to an end, giving way to some other experience, which may perhaps be the opposite kind of experience, so our experiences of good too come to an end. In our most positive experiences, when we discover ourselves to be at peace with the created world and at peace with God, we can almost see that this experience of God's goodness has put us in touch with a bedrock reality that does not come to an end. The realities of self and world become fuller, more three-dimensional, more secure, because we know that they are received from him and destined by him for his praise. Everything then turns on whether that experience, though itself is an experience which does not last, has told us something true and reliable, something that lasts in reality, or whether it is in the end an illusion. It's quite possible to look on the world as a whole and to see only the recurrence of decay the constant quenching of lights. And nihilism thus allies itself with the subjective view of the good in insisting that 
discovery of the good is in the end an exertion of the will. It tells us that we see the world most clearly when we see only its facts without its purported values. Facts persist, irrespective of who knows them or who cares about them. They are not for anybody or anything. They are just particles of inert reality that serve no purpose unless we bend our wills to purpose something in relation to them. But the good is not a fact that persists irrespective of who knows or cares about it. The idea of a good that there was nobody to enjoy and nobody to care about would be nonsense. So, the nihilist suggests, we should conclude that the reality of the good is no more than a reflection of our own struggle for self-definition, which itself is no more than a flickering epiphenomenon on the face of a universe of dead facts. Well, we can refuse that suggestion. But the alternative answer is open to us only as we learn to move beyond the observations appropriate to facts and begin to think reflectively about our existence. We shall never see the good if we look for it in the way we look for facts. Earlier in this lecture series, we heard mention of empirical research into the conditions for people being happy. Now, whatever that research has discovered, and it certainly has not discovered nothing, it's not what we see as the fulfillment of our good. Because our reaction to its findings is almost bound to be, but I could imagine fulfilling all those conditions and still not being happy. We shall learn to recognize the good only as we receive it as an address to us. It addresses us as God's own coming to meet us, assuming the reality of a thou to which we may and must answer. Now to say that, of course, is to take a step of faith. It goes beyond the detached observation of the work. Disillusioned nihilism belongs essentially to detached observers for whom the world and its time plays itself out as a show in which the end can be anticipated from the beginning and the whole becomes insufferably boring. The life of faith is not the life of observers. It's the life of actors who call on God to give them a part in the drama of this world's good, the, the good of something to do. And the theological thesis about the reality of the good then ought to take the same second person form that it takes in our poem. Good art thou, teach me thy statutes. It is expressed in the language of worship as an act in which experience is seen as the ground of existence. Yet if we are to take these words on our lips, and believe that the hidden source of universal good can be spoken to, we must first have heard ourselves spoken to. We must have heard the name of God proclaimed to us. I am that I am. We must have heard the narrative of God's good deeds and the promise of his good purposes. The good comes to us as we are spoken to in words of proclamation and promise. We meet it as we meet the burning bush that is not consumed, setting us on a path of action we had no idea of following before. Which is why the stanza did not begin and end with calling on the good, but began with the good that Adonai had done and ended with the good that the poet had experienced. To participate in the drama of the good, to call upon the good to teach us, we must be prepared by narrating the doings of goodness that were afoot before we could ever know of them. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Oliver. Uh, so much uh, to discuss here. And as our panelists uh, prepare their questions and as we start to uh, receive questions from your audience, uh, for those of you who are joining us the first time, let me also just briefly introduce our audience to you. Uh, we have with us Christian J. H. Excuse me, Christopher J. H. Wright, International Ministries Director of the Lingham Partnership International. Welcome, Chris. Welcome, Chris. Uh, Christian B. Miller is the A. C. Reed Professor of Philosophy at Wake Forest University. Welcome, Christian. Uh, we also had uh, lecturing earlier this year, but her schedule did not allow her to join us. Eleanor Stump, who uh, lectured in December. Uh, Paul Nedaleski, Assistant Director uh, and Fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture. Welcome, Paul. Uh, and Max J. Lee, Professor of New Testament at North Park Seminary. Welcome, Max. Um, and um, gentlemen, when I hand the floor over to you now, do we have any questions to begin the conversation? Go ahead, Christian. Thanks so much. And I, I want to say a general word of thank you also to Jeff and to Ian and everyone who is involved in organizing this series. It's been just a, an honor and a privilege to be a part of it the entire year. Thank you to all the hard, to, uh, all the organizers for all the hard work that went into it. It's sad that it's coming to an end today, um, but fittingly, it's coming to an end with a uh, with a wonderful paper that touches on many of the themes that we've discussed this year. Um, one topic I'd like to probe a little bit further um, with Oliver is the relationship between good and goods. So in the title of the paper, it's good, goods, and doing good. So if God is good, the ultimate good, the source of good, and there are good things in the world, there are good pencils, there are good people, um, there's good philosophy, there's bad philosophy too, sadly. Um, how are those related to each other? Um, how does the ultimate good relate to particular goods? One view that I've always found very attractive, and I wanted to see if Oliver agrees, um, has been put forward by the philosopher Robert Adams. And what I think is one of the greatest books written in moral philosophy in many decades, Finite and Infinite Goods. And so the way he thinks about it is that particular goods are good to the extent to which they resemble God and God's perfect goodness. So there's a relation of resemblance or mirroring that goes on. So something again is good to the extent to which it resembles the perfect goodness. Is that how you would be inclined to think of the matter, Oliver? Or do you have another way of saying more about the relationship between good and goods? Thank you very much, Paul. Um, just before I try to answer that, um, I'd just like to say that my screen is not showing Paul's face and I would like to see it. Um, is there any help we can go? I've, I've managed to end up with the event satisfaction form. Um, is there any way of getting off that and back to gazing people in the eyes again? Uh, can you see this? Are you in Zoom? Can you see the Zoom platform? Um, well, I, maybe I'm not in Zoom. Uh, I, I'm on a, a TIU forms, form stack. How did I get there? Do I have to call Zoom up again? I, I think you probably have the wrong application on your screen. Yes, I, I think I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I call Zoom up, will I get back to you? You should, yes. Yeah, there you are. Good, good. <laughs> Thank you. I would have done that out of my own it intelligence. Was, it was actually... When I do that by my own intelligence, it always goes wrong. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. Yes, sir. <laughs> So the, oh, no, I just wanted to clarify, it was, it was Christian that, I, that asked the questions. Oh, it was Christian that asked that question. Yeah, but that just shows uh, how, um, how wrong I, how much I needed to get back to the, <laughs> the real eye to eye again, Christian. Thank you. That's a lovely question. Um, uh, I was thinking about that, fortunately, as it happened just this morning. Um, my feeling about Bob Adams' theory here is that it has precisely half the truth about it. Um, I think there's something very profound in saying that good things resemble the good giver of things. Um, and that 
in some way, any good that we encounter can be seen as a form of image of God, um, reflecting him to us. And I certainly want to endorse that proposition. I feel he fails to say that the relationship is also one of gift, um, that it originates not simply in an observable resemblance. That's where I can compare um, this good orange with the goodness of God and see somehow by the sight of faith uh, what they relate. But that I receive it from him and I receive it from him as intended. To know something as good is in some way to have an intuition of an intention, a benevolent intention to me. And I want to put that in the account too. If I could just follow up really briefly. Um, so I, I, I welcome that as well. That seems very plausible to me. I would just want to distinguish between something being good and, and our knowing that it's good. Mm -hmm. um, so I was focusing specifically on its being good. Does that have to involve the idea of gift or is it just a matter of our knowing that something is good? The epistemological side is more of the gift. No, I want to say that this affects what it is to be good as well as to be known as good. Um, but to be good is to be part of God's donation. Um, in that context, one could say that only a created world could be good. Thank you so much. And just a reminder to our audience that we uh, welcome your questions as well. I see a few coming in. Let me start with uh, one question here. Oliver um, Lydia Yeager asks the question, why is the only conceivable history moral history? Thank you for that. I was just wondering whether somebody would be tempted by that bait and bite it. I am um, uh, uh, wondering how I would land the fish if somebody did. Um, we use the word history in a number of ways. Somebody, I suspect from the United States, but I can't be certain, said that history was just one damn thing after another. Um, and uh, there is that account of it. It is, as it were, an abstract ordering of events. Um, it's history when you say that in 1066, William the Conqueror landed on the shores of Kent and so on. Um, when we speak of history in a more philosophical or in a more theological way, we are looking for the coherence of events which makes them possible to narrate. And narrative is not simply a matter of listing events in sequence. Narrative is a matter of finding a unity that brings us from a first event to a last event. Of what kind could such a unity be? What is it that makes the difference between what the um, historians call a chronicle, simply? listing the events by years as they occur, and a history, which is offering us an a narrative interpretation of a sequence of events, takes us from the beginning to the middle to the end. And that has to be, I think, the realization of some good. Now, when I, the argument over that might go on a long time, but we are finding a kind of meaning in a sequence that would otherwise be empty, merely um, a, atomic, a series of things bumping into one another in time. What could such a meaning be? It can be only that by which we frame our understanding of time and history and our progression in history, which is hope. Uh, and the notion of hope undoubtedly implies uh, a good. That's a very rough, scrappy sort of answer to a, a well-targeted question. Um, I'm sorry that I think I can't go answer it more fully, but we would have to look in that direction. Okay. It's something I think I go on thinking quite a lot about. Oliver, if I could probe your question a little bit more. Mm -hmm. You grasped the weight of the question, but all of our 
listeners might not. Can you help us understand what's at stake in the question and what it's getting at for us? I think what's at stake in it is whether when you talk of history, you are talking about a kind of meaning. Um, sometimes people use the word history simply to mean contingent events, uh, as it were, events deprived of meaning. Uh, simply the here and now, uh, what is going on, whatever it may be, uh, without any reference to anything. I think that when we think of history properly, and certainly when we think of God intervening in history and God shaping history by his actions, we are thinking of events carrying in their sequence a real meaning that speaks to us in some sense of purpose, of shape, of form. And that I think is what's lying behind the question. Um, if I understand the question right, I simply asserted uh, that to speak of history meaningfully, you have to speak of such a form. And uh, quite rightly, the questioner challenged me on it, demanded to know more. Oh, it looks like you're- Oliver, yeah. Uh, Oliver, thank you for this uh, great paper and presentation. Um, I don't have a question, but just sort of a, an elaboration of something you said that I, I am finding very helpful. Um, at, at various points through your paper, you talk about how difficult it is to get to the notion of good and firmly in mind in different ways. You know, how can all be, you know, there's different ways of speaking of the good. We call very disparate kinds of things good. We're using the same term in each case, but clearly there's huge divergences in the kinds of things we're talking about and the ways we're predicating or attributing it. Um, these are barriers to understanding it. it uh, but uh, it seems to me that in the end, you point out uh, some sort of central or primary way the good is the, is the source, is, we're talking about the source of good. It com comes back to God. Uh, God is a personal being. And that is, a, that is a claim that coheres well with you know, traditional Christian theology, certain kinds of philosophical thought. Uh, and that seems right to me. Uh, by itself, it's still difficult to understand. You know how you know we want to we want to speak about the good, or think about it finally being um, like a property or a universal or something. You know something that we can say these things resemble each other in virtue of the fact they're good. But you challenge that a bit um, in digging into how the psalmist talks about uh, God gooding or the good gooding, which I think is also helpful. But I but you also. Um, tie this personal foundational conception of the good into our, our experience of the world, which is the part that I found most helpful, you know, saying there's something about the most genuine and deep uh, experiences of a good that involve uh, grace or the reception of this gift. It's being communicated to us in some way, and there is something intelligible that we can, that we can cotton onto in these experiences. And I just, I, I appreciated how that coheres with this more theoretical understanding of the good as a, as being something constitutively about our personal being, it's um, it makes a sort of this person this personal view of goodness uh, more coherent um, and, and easier to retain and, and I don't know a little it makes it a little bit more intelligible I think at least for me so thank you for that thank you I um, I sometimes like to quote. The, um, the words of a businessman that I read um, a good number of years ago, um, who had founded a business which had been enormously successful and was reflecting on the success of his business. And uh, he wrote, if I believed in God, I would say thank you. I thought that was extraordinarily searching and provocative remark because uh, well, he's honest enough not simply to say, I feel very thankful without um, uh, uh, allowing himself to be pressed on who he's thankful to. At the same time, he's prepared to suggest, and I think rightly, that there is something very difficult in appreciating and receiving good experiences 
if you are banned from being thankful. Um, thankfulness, a sense of reception, um, is part of the way instinctively we grab good, we recognize it with our mind, we say that's good. And this sort of brought home to me this notion that actually to experience good is to experience or to seem to experience some kind of a communication. Mm -hmm. Now you could always say, you know, of course, the philosophers can always say if they don't want to go that route, and of course, I, nobody can make them. Um, uh, one can always say, uh, that um, this is just a seeming. This is an analogy. It's a bit like uh, somebody being nice to you or receiving a gift or something like that. Um, and it may be that that is as far as one can press the question. Is this experience essentially a reception of something? Is it just a bit like a reception of something? Well, uh, we'll each have to make up our own mind about that. But this sense of the good as received, received as a communication, and dress to me seems to me to be absolutely central to our experience, quite ordinary experience. Um, we don't have to be a theologian to say, well, if I believed in God, I would say that. Thank you. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Oliver, what you were just saying there reminded, this is not my question, but it's sort of immediate response to what you just said. Looks, sounds very like Romans chapter one, verse 21, isn't it? That the in a sense, the essence of the human uh, state of idolatry is that though they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. Paul seems to be saying there is something about thankfulness, which is quintessentially human in relation mm -hmm. to God, and mm -hmm. that the rejection of God denies us thankfulness uh, mm -hmm. in return. So I, I think that's quite a profound theological point uh, as well. But the question I was really interested in, and it's, it's, it's again, partly an observation or a question, but um, I'm wondering whether since you started with Psalm 119, uh, we might continue something of the, the conversation with those texts that seem to me to come in two other places that, that it immediately reminded me of, where precisely that kind of language that begins with the word tov, you know, good is this or that, uh, and, and one uh, in an ironical way is in Ecclesiastes, where uh, the, the, the philosopher exploring his journey through Ecclesiastes seems to be constantly doing two things. One, affirming that there is something good. It, there is, there's nothing better, he says, and it's just the same word good, than to enjoy the gifts of life and work and sex and uh, food and drink and so on. And yet uh, he keeps on coming up against this impasse that he says in, in chapter six, verse 12, who knows what is good? For a person he seems to be struggling to find exactly the question you're asking what is the good and he mm. can't quite get it even though he's affirming it through creation and the interesting thing in light of what you say is that in ecclesiastes he never comes to the point of addressing god there's never a good art thou uh, in the book uh, it really it, it's only when we come to the frame narrator at the end of ecclesiastes who kind of has to do a little bit of corrective work on some of Kohelet's wilder things and say yeah but actually we still need to fear god and keep mm. his commandments but the, the book itself seems to want to answer the question but never quite does and one of the reasons that he doesn't is because he almost reaches a kind of nihilism based on the suffering and the absurdity and the stupidity and the evil that he sees in life. And it, the other place that I wanted to go was to Lamentations, because it seems that there you have someone who has suffered intensely and describes it all the way through the book. But right in the center of the book, you get these three verses all beginning with the letter uh, Taith uh, again. Good is the Lord to those who talk with him. Good it is to wait quietly for the Lord and good it is for a man to bear affliction in his youth, which, mm -hmm. which is very similar to what Psalm 119 says, mm -hmm. and you think there may even be a memory there of that Psalm, uh, that even in the midst of suffering, goodness can be discovered, mm -hmm. which would be an odd thing to say uh, without the reality of his affirmation that this is God who's doing this, that God is in this somewhere, yeah. and he can still affirm goodness. I'm just wondering if there's any reflections you might have extending your Psalm 119 entree. Absolutely, that's a, that, um, how fortunate we are to have uh, 
good Old Testament scholar joining in this uh, and helping me with my um, amateur uh, uses of the Old Testament. Um, Chris has pointed, of course, directly to the nearest thing there is to Psalm 119, the long psalm in the Hebrew Bible, which is uh, the third chapter of Lamentations. Lamentations also consisting of alphabetic poems. And one of them, the third chapter, um, venturing to have, as it were, um, three line stanzas, each beginning with the same letter and compared with the eight line stanzas um, of uh, Psalm 119 and come the letter Ted, what does that poet do? But as Chris points out, offer us three goods right at the center of his lament. A very powerful, um, just as poetry, very powerful. Uh, um, but also very sort of self-conscious in its construction, building the whole thing around this letter and what this letter can do. Uh, and repeating the word. Um, the, the alphabetical psalms don't have to repeat the words, which have this, as we saw, which have the same letters beginning. Sometimes they choose to when the poet wants to really bring something home and highlight it. And um, I'm sure that's exactly what the poet of Lamentations, whoever he may be, uh, is doing in that poem. Um, Ecclesiastes, uh, Coelith is really fascinating and one could talk for so long about him. I, I find, I, I don't quite want to go as far as you, Chris, in finding streaks of nihilism in him, but he is undoubtedly looking into a very skeptical boy, void. He is, he is, as you quite rightly say, asking by what possible criterion we can identify um, real goods as opposed to what we think are goods at the time. And he is quite taken up with the impossibility of um, future horizons really yielding us a clear notion of the good. Um, I am saving so much out of my salary each month so that I shall have a retirement uh, um, sum that I can buy a really nice house with and garden when I retire. That's the kind of argument um, Ecclesiastes wants to tell us. Uh, you're very foolish. <laughs> that, that kind of ambition is simply a speculation. Um, we don't, you don't grasp the good by thinking in those terms of prudence, capital planning, planning particularly, he's rather against, I think, which is when he says, well, the best thing to do is to take the good, if you're sitting in front of a good meal, eat it, one might say. Um, that is the good that's actually there to hand, you can be sure of that, he's certainly saying. At the same time, he's very conscious, obviously, um, that the future you can't calculate on rests in the dis in in the in, in the decision of God, and remembering that becomes very important. So far as I can see in Ecclesiastes, you can only remember it. It's humbling. It's warning you. It's a kind of frontier. Be careful not to cross this. Just remember this. Even when you're young and have lots of good meals to eat, lots of good exercise to take, and you don't have bad knees and sore joints, remember it. Um, and you're quite right. He doesn't get to the point that the psalmist gets to. Um, just leaves the door open for what there might be there, I think. Chris, would you want to respond? Uh, otherwise, I'm like, okay. We have a couple audience questions. Oh, okay. that, oh, go ahead, Max. Well, no, um, I'll maybe we can entertain an audience question first since the, the queue is getting long, and then I'll and I would I do have a question, and you can come back to me. Is it that what is it in this stream or is it? In uh, it 
it, it might be a different, okay, well, I'll just answer it. So, so we, we could um, it's a little bit different, but um, it's, it's more along the stream of what Paul w- was getting at, his comment, um, it dovetails off that. Okay, um, so, um, so I just wanted to address um, uh, Oliver's, uh, it's a, br- a brilliant paper, loved it, but his reticence on abstraction. So um, you, you, in your paper, you um, critiqued philosophy as um, uh, that um, there, one approach would be, it moves from adjectives to the abstraction of a noun. So we take the properties or attributes of good things in the world and we try to abstract that into a concept of goodness. And, uh, and what I would like to suggest is, is that from what I read in your paper, that theology could be, instead of moving from the adjective, we move from the verb or actions whose agent is God. And why not venture into then trying to abstract what goodness is based on the verb, not the adjective. And the reason why I asked this question is because I think that's what the Septuagint translator does, which is a, a text that you didn't examine in your paper. Um, in, uh, so in the, the Masoretic text, uh, you pointed out that uh, Yumethib is, for lack of a better translation, you're gooding. It's a, it's a good as a verb. But in the Septuagint, it translates it um, as ente um, kreistatete, which means in your goodness. So in the Septuagint, it says, you are good, Lord. And instead of saying you are gooding, it says in your goodness, teach me your righteous acts. So I actually see the Septuagint translator kind mm-hmm. of abstracting from the good deeds, a general conception of goodness. So theologically, uh, would you mind if, if um, could you, can I push you to give an abstraction of the good from God's revelatory actions? You mentioned grace and God's giving, but could you give us a definition to work with for lack of a better, better category? So if God is the self-communicated good, what has God taught us about goodness and communicated to us? And knowing that whatever we say might not be an exhaustive answer. Um, there's somewhat of a mystery to the goodness of God and God continues to reveal what goodness is as he interacts with human beings now uh, and in the future, as well as what he's revealed in the past. But could you, would you venture into giving us an abstraction? Hmm. Thank you. Um, Oh, there's a lot there. Um, Just on that Septuagint translation, the Septuagint is often very good in translating Psalm 119. Um, uh, uh, And incidentally, um, just as uh, to observe, en passant, for those interested in the philological side of this, the Septuagint translators did manage to keep the first word of each line in the first position uh, when translating into Greek. Um, they knew what they were doing. They, am I to assume that they understood the sentences dividing before ente Christotete? Um, good art thou. In your goodness, teach me your statutes. Is that how you read it? Um, yeah. So I think, um, I, I mean, in your goodness, but I, but I do feel like that's what what I'm trying to point out mm. is the phrase, the verb has been replaced by that prepositional phrase. So it has, it it, it has indeed, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, but to make and, sense, of the prepositional phrase. Uh, you you would have it, to take with what follows rather that's than right that it is true yeah that is true i see what you're saying yes. yeah and i think that does suggest that they may have translated a text without a vowel without the ant mm-hmm. um i don't know um okay chris may have a view uh but this is this is merely preliminary skirmishing this is mm-hmm. not addressing a serious question um how which are your serious question i take it is how do we what can we say about the God if about the good if um, we are talking about fundamentally as God's action towards us? Yeah. Well, I, I, it seems to me the answer to that has to be um, that our talk about the good is going to be first of all. Um, and this is only a matter of sort of ordering, but it's significant. First of all, narrative. It's going to be a telling of the good things God has done. It's going to be a repeating of the saving history and uh, of our experiences of the saving history. It's going to have a certain confessional element in it. God did this for me. Um, 
And God did this for his people. God did this for the human race. Um, and it's going to be that rather than, as it were, based on a series of observations of different kinds of things which seem to make manifest the same quality. Now, I don't want to be understood to say that nothing one could derive from comparing different kinds of good thing and abstracting what they contain, what they might do for me. I mean, you might say that is good, which helps me rejoice or, or something like that. This is what a good glass of wine, a good book, uh, a good friend, all have in common, <clears throat> namely that I, I rejoice in them. That's a perfectly intelligible thing to say and not wrong. Um, I merely want to say that there are all kinds of uses of the good we encounter that simply won't quite be cramped into that mold. So uh, abstraction is fine, uh, so long as one doesn't confuse it for the original. So we, uh, so we, you're reticent against, um, say, the expression of goodness propositionally. You, you, you mentioned that you prefer the narrative form, which presents the story of God as actor. Mm. Narratives are propositions too, of course. Um, yeah, and, uh, um, expositional, so maybe expositional might be the yeah, best way. They're just different, different yeah. types of propositions. Yeah. Um, I mean, it seems to me that that is where you have to begin. Mm -hmm. And from that, of course, you can branch out into all kinds of propositions. I mean, uh, the Christian gospel begins with a narrative of history. It begins with the word became flesh. Actually, it probably begins with creation and then the word <laughs> became flesh. Uh, we can argue about that at another time. But um, it gives way into all kinds of um, generalized ordering, systematizing, propositions, which all of which have their value and importance in helping us to get a purchase on the meaning of that narrative. Um, it's simply that, uh, as it were, narrative can sometimes come first. I think there's an assumption, there may be an unexamined assumption among some of us, yes, theologians and philosophers particularly, that narrative is always somewhat secondary. Narrative somehow illustrates a universal truth I've just been able to formulate. Um, in, in a non-narrative proposition, but of course it doesn't. Thank you. Appreciate the answer. Oliver, would I be correct in saying that you're wanting to emphasize narrative because you're wanting to emphasize the interpersonal? And let me just signal one line um, that came early in your talk. You said, uh, to take only one thing away, let me be this, our experience of the good is not originally derived from anything that is or attributed to anything that is. The good is simply met with. Met with, yes. And so could you, is, is there something about the interpersonal nature of the good that you're trying to emphasize or is it the trans transcendent? What is, what are you prioritizing the narrative? I'm simply trying to indicate that the role of experience, um, and Having said that, one must not narrow the notion of experience improperly to only this kind of experience, uh, a strange warming of the heart or something like that. I mean, that's, a, that's an experience, but it's only one of millions of types of experience. Um, nor does one narrow it necessarily to a, a personal, in the sense of an individual experience, something that one person, all by him or herself, experiences. The human race has its experiences. We have had experiences. Um, we have had an experience of a pandemic. Um, and no one of us has had the totality of that experience. We've all had little fragments of experience, but it's still right to talk about the pandemic as having been experienced simultaneously by all the nations of the world. Um, uh, uh, collectively. So the good is met with. Good is an experience in that broad sense. It is 
our reflections on it must begin from the experience of goodness as we encounter it, personally, collectively, historically, in the present. Open the whole door there. I have a couple questions, I think, relating to your the first theological implications. So let me start with um, a question from Joel Chop. Could you elaborate further on your claim that only a created world could be good? More specifically, if givenness is fundamental to the nature of the goods, small g, is the implication that an immanentist accounts of creation or accounts that viewed creation as a necessary consequence of God's being, the world couldn't properly be called good? Uh, I didn't quite get the second half of that. It, on what conditions does the questioner say the world couldn't be called good? If givenness is fundamental to the nature of goods, small g, yeah. is the implication that on an imminentist, that on imminentist accounts of creation or accounts that viewed creation as a necessary consequence of God's being, the world couldn't uh -huh. properly... I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. And I'm with the uh, question. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I, I hadn't thought about this, but I think the question may be right. That may be the implication. Um, what I think, if I understand what he means by an immanentist account, what I under, what I would take that to mean is an account which tends to resolve um, the good and all values into certain types of recurrent law. If he means that, then yes, the implication of what I'm saying is uh, that there could be no real grasp of the good in a world that was constantly, totally and exclusively governed by imminently recurrent laws. Um, there would be patterns of various kinds. Uh, there would be... Uh, I'm sorry, Oliver, I'm, I misread it. It's emanationist. Emanationist, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, that's good. That um, yeah, Jeffrey, sorry. Um, on an emanationist account, now that gives me more to think about, and I'm not quite sure how to approach it. If by emanationist account, one means an account that abstracts in some way from God's intention. Um, and attributes being to God without, as it were, the history shaping will, then I think the implication will follow that such a world cannot properly encompass a good. Because I think there has to be a voluntative aspect in the giving and receiving of the good. Um, however, I mean, the exact scope one gives to the notion of will is different difficult and we can't get into that but if an emanationist account is one in which god by his sheer being just by being makes everything around him as it were what it is without thinking about it without a will without intending then i think yes such a universe could not contain good in the sense that we are habituated to use the term good I mean, one might find other uses to them. Another question related to the first theological implication, how might the givenness of the good chasten, chasten how we understand human desire? Chasten, that was the verb to chasten, was it? Correct. Yeah, good. Hmm. Um, we have some serious thinking questions. Um, this, I think, in this way, I think it chastens it. That 
before desire, there comes admiration, gratitude, wonder, that aspect of the love affects. What is at root here, I think, is the understanding of the nature of the love we have for the good. Um, and I think the question is prodding me to say, and I, sh if I understand the question, um, and I'm very willing to be prodded uh, in this direction, that desire cannot be the primary form that love of the good takes, though it may be a very important second form. Um, desire essentially concerns the good that is absent, the good that we look forward to, that we hope to realize, that we long for. Um, that is important, it's an important aspect of our love of the good, that we should long for the good in its fulfillment, but it's preceded by wondering, grateful reception. Admiration is a, is a loose term that I sometimes use to describe it. Let me ask a, a slightly uh, different question that has been with us for the whole year. In what way do predation, disease, and biological death understood as created reflect the goodness of creation? Or the, excuse me, the goodness of God. How does predation, disease, and death understand the uh, uh, the, the goodness of God. Um, the answer has to be in a narrative of what God does for the world in which there are such things. That is to say, if we are to start with the notion that this world consists entirely of regularities, potato blight feeds on potatoes um, just as human beings feed on potatoes. Potatoes feed on chemical elements in the soil. Human beings, when they are buried, provide chemical elements that potatoes can feed upon. That kind of biological circle, which we're so familiar with thinking about. We will not find the good within that circle. Um, it is a circle of nature. Nature has its form, its structure, and it is a repetitive one. Nature is that which happens in some way or other every time. Uh, and nature therefore can always be traced in two directions. Um, so uh, potatoes, can look on potato blight as an illness they want to avoid. Potato blight can look on potatoes as a food that they want to consume. Um, there is where there is good, uh, there is evil. And the two are always present. If we are to speak of the creative goodness of God as transcending all that and being in some sense beyond it, we have to speak of it in terms of God's purposes for history. What is this world in which there are these circular forms in which we are born, grow, flourish, grow weaker and die? How does this world assume a moral shape such that we can see it as the overall purpose of a God, which is another reason for starting with narrative? Uh, I've rather gone around uh, a long way to get to the answer to that question, but I hope not too far to be followed. We have perhaps time for one more question. Any, any other questions from the panelists today? Um, uh, well, uh, yeah. Uh, could you help us to, um, I feel like one difficulty is that um, if, Goodness is something to be experienced in, in, in God's actions at a relational basis. Um, the human nature is always going to be trying to think about that goodness is somehow defined as what's good for me. And could you explain to me the limitations of that approach that limiting goodness experientially as what's good for me uh, and, and how God 
and that good goodness is actually a, a, perhaps a larger concept than that. Hmm. Uh, I think I think humanity is always going to be uh, kind of um, strapped down a little bit, or or hindered, or limited by by the experiential sphere in which goodness is is defined. We can, of course, be too frightened by the idea of something being good for me. Um, uh, the, the history of Christian reflection on the good has a number of, one might say, false trails leading off it that have simply sought to try to eliminate that notion of for me altogether, good in itself. We were taught um, by some of the mystics that um, what we had to be able to do was to embrace the prospect of our own damnation and loss um, and still say God was good. Um, that is just a thought experiment that is trying to give to God is good a sense in which God is good in himself, simply, without being good for me. That, I think, is something that certainly could have been true before God created the world. But the terms on which it could be true would be terms on which I could never know it to be true because I am a creature. I am not um, another God looking on and observing uh, that this God has, as it were, committed his goodness to creation. I am actually part of the result of that. And therefore, um, though I must always say that good for me, certainly if me is personal, simply personal, doesn't even include my children, my wife, my family, let alone my, the human race, uh, is very, very narrow. That narrowness, it, that narrow purchase is nevertheless essential. That narrow for me is the point at which I, in my enclosed position, can grasp a goodness that is enormously wider <laughs> and enormously more generous than what it does for me. It can, as it were, um, get the reality of what it means that God has given himself a world and given himself to a world and a history and not just to one simple soul. So the phrase I prefer, I think, is God is good for me too. We can say good for me, but we always gloss it as good for me too as well. I am caught up in this, in which God is good for his creation. Um, and I cannot imagine myself not caught up in it. In that sense, um, uh, I can recognize this for me as the point of purchase I have on, on, on a reality that is vastly transcends me. I, that's only a start towards answering that question, but uh, it's such a big question, but I, I, I hope it was points in the direction we need to go. I really appreciated that, that response. Thank you very much. Thanks, Max. Uh, we are uh, just about out of time here, but I'd like to end maybe with one question. Um, given that you hold the chair, held titles of pastoral and practical theology, one might listen to this conversation and say, oh, it's just a bunch of speculation on, on a word. Um, if you were to maybe give a last word about what's at stake in thinking about the goodness of creation to say a, a Christian in education, a Christian working in the sciences, um, a mom raising children, if, they, if you were to say what's at stake in the good, as opposed to just sort of philosophical and theological speculation, how would you answer that person? Why does this conversation that we've been a part of for the last year matter to the church? I think the answer to that is that it's about the It's about the resistibility of despair. I think the person to whom I should like 
this lecture to be addressed first is not the busy person. Uh, you suggested a teacher or a mother in a home or whatever. I would like it to be addressed to someone on a deathbed. I think it is the point at which we wonder, and it's, this is a part of our human experience of the world, when, when the meaning of it drains away, and we wonder, what has all this been for? <laughs> that is the point at which we have to grasp the importance of God being good and his goodness being in gift. Um, it, it, it then, it seems to me, becomes extraordinarily real. Um, we poor theologians, to try to convey it, wrap it up in endless concepts, but at the bottom there is a deeply human experience of wondering, um, wondering what this life can possibly be for or about, which is a terrible experience and can be terrible. It gives us a reason uh, to conclude in, a, in the line of a, a rather nice poem by Hilaire Belloc. I think I shall not hang myself today. We have reasons not to. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Oliver. Thank you also, Chris, Christian, Paul and Max for being with us this year. And great thank to be you. here. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. My privilege and pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Yeah, it's been great to great to interact with Oliver again after many years. Thank you. Thank everybody for their I thank everybody for their lectures. We've had um, a lot of hard work in this series, obviously. <laughs>